Uh, that window just popped up a timer. I'll just put it. It, it looks like it's okay. It's not. Yeah, it's not on the screen. Yeah. It, it popped up again. It says an hour long until the timer goes off. I don't know what that means. Yeah, just ignore it and. Oh God, yeah, I press minimize. So okay, I'll start my timer and then I'll go find a tech person. That sounds good. That sounds good. All right. Hello, my name is Andrew Rangel. I'm a fourth year political science student at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and today I'll be discussing U.S. nuclear modernization. On February 14, 2024, the New York Times reported Russia's advances on space based nuclear weapons draw U.S. concerns, highlighting the urgency the United States faces to respond to an increasingly antagonistic Moscow. Such fears arose as a result of a public statement from the House Intelligence Chairman Mike Turner who warned of a grave threat to American security, which an anonymous U.S. Defense Department official later confirmed referred to Russian space capabilities. Days after the congressman's announcement, President Biden spoke on the matter, lamenting that Russia's rumored technological advances involved an unused satellite design that could damage other orbital objects, but not directly harm anyone on Earth, stating, quote, there is no nuclear threat to the people of America or anywhere else in the world with what Russia is doing. Though the weapon Representative Turner directed public attention towards ultimately did not, endanger, did not endanger the planet, questions about the future of nuclear threats are hardly unwarranted. Vladimir Putin's 2022 invasion of Ukraine immediately invoked fears of nuclear usage. Such worries were only perpetuated when Russia withdrew from both the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. To further complicate matters, President Putin announced the movement of Russian tactical nuclear weapons to neighboring Belarus in an attempt to mirror Western aggression, explaining that Russia was simply, quote, doing what they have been doing for decades, stationing them in certain allied countries, preparing the launch platforms, and training the crews. Russia has also deepened nuclear collaboration with China, as Moscow now supplies Beijing's super reactor with highly enriched uranium that could be used to dwarf the United States' arsenal. The significance of these events cannot be underscored, as the cost of nuclear warfare is the very world we know today. In response, the U.S. government has spent the past decade pursuing nuclear modernization, which is the improvement of existing nuclear technology and development of new weapons and launch systems. Though many Americans may not realizing it, realize it, we are living through an era of policy change that is redirecting the world towards a war of superpowers fought with weapons of mass destruction. The rising potential for nuclear warfare leads me to ask the following research question. How is the US government modernizing its nuclear arsenal to prepare for future conflict? I hypothesize that expanding the nuclear arsenal by diversifying its weapons types and optimizing launch capabilities will increase the likelihood of war. The scholarly wisdom in political science remains committed to the Cold War perspective of deterrence through mutually assured destruction. According to the late Kenneth Waltz, a professor of political science at University of California, Berkeley, quote, nuclear weapons can carry out their deterrent task no matter what other countries do. Waltz elaborates that the explosive power of a nuclear warhead constitutes enough of a threat to any country that a potential adversary wouldn't dare launch a strike. Similarly, Daryl Press and Kier Lieber, professors at Dartmouth and Georgetown respectively, argue that, quote, the best and least destabilizing way to deter counter city strikes on the U.S. homeland by a leading nuclear power is to threaten retaliation in kind, end quote. While the possession of nuclear weapons may lead to deterrence, the scholarly wisdom is misleading because it ignores the fact that when one country bolsters its arsenal and improves technological capabilities, its rivals follow suit. For however much one stockpile is strengthened, a near equal reaction will be elicited in response, leading competitive nations to innovate their arsenals in ways that conventional deterrence fails to account for. My research will fill this gap in the existing scholarship by accounting for recent technological developments that dilute the effectiveness of deterrence. To explain how the United States government modernizes its nuclear arsenal to prepare for future wars, my paper uses qualitative methodology in the form of case study research. With varieties of innovation as my unit of analysis, these case studies will assess how the U.S. develops one, 
low yield nuclear weapons, and two, space-based technology to brace for potential conflict. In order to reach valid conclusions, this paper will employ both primary and secondary sources with a larger emphasis on the former. First-hand evidence will be drawn from sources such as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the U.S. Department of Defense, and the U.S. State Department. Secondary sources will originate from unbiased media outlets and think tanks, including the Associated Press, Reuters, and the New York Times. Now I'll begin my first case study. Low-yield bombs, also known as tactical or non-strategic explosives, would generally be considered for usage in short-range military settings as a result of their relatively limited blast capacity. The emergence of a non-strategic weapon first appeared under the Obama administration in 2015 when the Pentagon tested a precision-guided B-61 nuclear bomb, pictured here, that featured a low-yield option intended as a bunker buster for Iran's underground nuclear facilities so as to tactically destroy strategically significant sites without broad harm to civilian populations. The creation of such an advanced tool of war marked a vast and arguably hypocritical departure from Obama's 2009 declaration that he envisioned, quote, a world without nuclear weapons. The case in support of such devices, as laid out by Don Cook, the former Deputy Administrator for Defense Programs at the National Nuclear Security Administration, posits that, quote, a lower yield, more accurate U.S. weapon constitutes a better deterrent, specifically because it will be regarded by an adversary as more usable, and that the likelihood of weapons use is therefore lower and not higher. Meanwhile, opponents to tactical devices, including the former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General James Cartwright, admitted that, quote, what going smaller does is make the weapon more usable. Cartwright's argument highlights the most pressing and dangerous aspect of low-yield weapons, their applicability, as one launch may be enough to instigate a full-scale nuclear war. Obama may have opened the gates to non-strategic nuclear weapons, but Donald Trump doubled down on the initiative. When asked about his comments supporting an expansion of the nuclear arsenal and the dangers such action would provoke from the international community, President-elect Trump stated in an interview, quote, let it be an arms race. We will outmatch them at every pass and outlast them all. Living up to Trump's declaration, the Department of Defense's 2018 Nuclear Posture Review ordered the first entirely new nuclear design into production since the Cold War. The report disclosed that the Pentagon would commission the W-76, described as, quote, a low-yield submarine launch ballistic missile warhead to ensure a prompt response option that is able to penetrate adversary defenses. By February of 2020, the Navy had implemented these warheads in a variety of armaments, though the specifics of their placement remain classified. After campaigning with a relatively neutral stance on nuclear weapons role in the world, President Biden's actions represent continuity with his predecessor. At a time of extreme tension with both Russia and China, Biden has continued the path of modernization bringing the world ever closer to what he described as, quote, nuclear Armageddon. In October of 2023, the Pentagon announced its intentions to obtain a new variation on its B-61 gravity bomb, pictured here, as an instrument that the Defense Department acknowledged was designed to threaten large military complexes without endangering population centers, the exact circumstances for a low-yield bomb. Scant progress on the project has been published since the press release last fall, but Biden's commitment to growing the nuclear arsenal by implementing a broader spectrum of weapons appears unwavering, solidifying the U.S. for years to come. Now I'll move on to my second case study, space-based technology. The conversation around space-based technology encompasses a wide array of weapons and devices meant for more than simply launching nuclear strikes as satellites orbiting Earth provide vital information and detection networks that the U.S. military so heavily depends on for every facet of operations, including nuclear insights. As with low-yield weapons, investment in space-based tech ramped up near the end of Obama's tenure. In, the 2016, Defense, in 2016, the Defense Department unveiled its new doctrine, known as the Third Offset Strategy which aim to secure American superiority in a variety of advanced technological fields, including space, by initiating new governmental collaboration with entities in the private sector, like, like SpaceX and Blue Origin, who pioneered methods to drastically reduce the cost of sending satellites into orbit. 
that method was quickly co-opted by military personnel to bolster satellite networks that assist nuclear defenses and the broader U.S. communications capabilities. When Donald Trump entered the White House, the space-based military sector soon saw the most substantial influx of funding since the Reagan administration. In the Department of Defense's 2019 Missile Defense Review, the Pentagon announced its plans to research, one, a missile interceptor layer, which is a series of weaponized satellites meant to shoot down ICBMs during their flight path, and two, space-based sensors intended to detect missile launches around the world. President Trump described the DOD's goals as, quote, ensuring that we can detect and destroy any missile launched against the United States, anywhere, any time, any place. Beyond instigating the path to new technologies, Trump's most notable contribution to the nuclear modernization in space came from his formation of the Armed Services' newest branch since the 1940s, the Space Force. The president described the purpose behind the agency's creation, saying, quote, it is not enough merely having an American presence in space, we must have American dominance in space. President Trump's remarks indicate just how militarized outer space is. The core reason for achieving U.S. dominance beyond the atmosphere has nothing to do with starry-eyed exploration of the cosmos, but is instead focused entirely on commanding the environment that can target any location on Earth, granting its controllers near absolute military superiority. This vision has remained constant through administrations, as echoed by Chief of Space Operations General Chance Saltzman at a security forum in March of this year, who posited, quote, we must protect our space capabilities while being able to deny any adversary the hostile use of its space capabilities. Since its inception, the Space Force has strengthened the nuclear apparatus by producing the space-based infrared system a satellite constellation that captures infrared pictures on Earth every 10 seconds to detect any weapons launches or tests. The new branch also announced the supplemental constellation, known as the Overhead Persistent Infrared Satellite, which offers revolutionary surveillance and detection capabilities and is scheduled to launch in 2025. Both devices enable the U.S. to pinpoint targets across the globe with unprecedented efficiency should an American strike ever come to fruition. The satellite network also allows for nearly instantaneous identification of nuclear launches that could give leaders the crucial time needed to respond. As for my research findings, throughout my research, the conclusion I continuously have arrived at highlights the probability of escalating international nuclear tensions. From Obama, who spoke of a nuclear-free world and even received a Nobel Peace Prize, to Trump, and now Biden, U.S. leaders from both major political parties see modernizing the nuclear arsenal as an essential policy in their administrations. My first case study regarding low-yield warheads demonstrates the growing accessibility of weapons of mass destruction, arguably heightening the likelihood of usage. When a government possesses a tactical nuclear weapon, it may view the option in the realm of conventional warfare and initiate a destructive exchange of population-killing bombs. My case study on space-based technology denotes a similar bottom line. Though the devices deployed in space are not yet nuclear themselves, their contribution to making the arsenal far more efficient and therefore dangerous speaks volumes. As the US and its rivals struggle for dominance in space, the widespread militarization only raises the chances of a conflict because of how committed to dominating the terrain nations are. But so what? What are the implications of my research findings? At a time where the international system is being tested more than ever, countries continue to accelerate towards more advanced nuclear weaponry that only threatens the notion of a war-free world. Policymakers and political science scholars must reevaluate Cold War era perspectives and recognize the terrifying realities associated with ever modernizing technology for nuclear weapons so as to avoid a horrific mass extinction event that could serve as a consequence from furthering down the present path. I have my sources listed here and I would like to thank Professor Shelley Hurt for her guidance through this process as well as Cal Poly's political science department and my peers for their constant support. And I welcome any questions. Thank you.